please rise. The President of the New York State Bar Association, the Associate Judges of the New York State Court of Appeals, the Chief Administrative Judge of the Unified Court System, the Attorney General of the State of New York, and the Chief Judge of the State of New York. The Law Day Ceremony will now begin. Please be seated, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Law Day 2022. This year, we are especially excited about our Law Day celebration because we're back home here in beautiful Court of Appeals Hall after two years of virtual celebrations. And while we are still limited in our in-person footprint, we do want to thank you all who are here in our courtroom for being here with us today, and of course, everyone who is participating virtually. For more than three decades, the judges of this court have been honored to co-host our Law Day celebration event with the Attorney General of the State of New York, and I want to thank the Attorney General, Letitia James, for her always enthusiastic and supportive approach to our Law Day ceremony. So thank you, General James. We also have with us today T. Andrew Brown. It's our tradition to have the President of the New York State Bar Association participate in the ceremonies, and thank you, President Brown, for being here today. We'll begin the ceremony as we do every year with the Pledge of Allegiance, and this year we have two very special, special guests who will lead us in the pledge, Lily and Sage Malika, who are first grade students right across the river at the Van Rensselaer Elementary School. Lily and Sage, please come up to the microphone. Their dad, Jonathan Malika, is one of our very valued court professionals here at the courthouse. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Excellent, excellent job, girls. Thank you very much. And please remain standing because now I invite our New York State Court Officer Sergeant Peter Robinson from the 8th Judicial District to lead us in singing the national anthem. Thank you, Sergeant, for returning once again to perform for us. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Please be seated, everyone, and thank you, Sergeant, for that beautiful rendition. Joining us today are a number of dignitaries, public officials, and leaders from the executive and legislative branches of our government, from the judiciary, 
and from the legal profession. And in order to show our respect and appreciation for their service and for the time that they have taken from their busy schedules today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge them and their presence. Starting as we always do, family first. I'll start with Leslie Stein, our former and must, much missed colleague here on the court. Judge Stein, thank you for being here. Our clerk of the court, Lisa LaCour, who is enjoying her very first day today in her new position. <laughs> Ms. LaCour succeeds John Asello, who served with great distinction at this court for over 40 years and recently retired, in fact, just this past Friday, and we wish him well in the next chapter of his life. Our Chief Administrative Judge, Lawrence Marks, we are pleased to be joined today by the court's entire leadership team, including all four presiding justices of the Appellate Division and the members of our Administrative Board of the Courts, Rolando Acosta from the First Department, Hector LaSalle from the Second Department, Elizabeth Gary from the Third Department, and Gerald Whalen from the Fourth Department. We are also joined by two former presiding justices, Randall Ang, former presiding justice of the Second Department, and Karen Peters, former presiding justice of the Third Department. Welcome to the, back to the court, and thank you both for being here today. Our Deputy Chief Administrative Judges, Edwina Mendelson, the Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for Statewide Justice Initiatives, who also in her spare time happens to be leading our very important implementation around our Equal Justice Initiatives. Tamiko Amaker, who is the Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for Management Support, Norman St. George for the courts outside New York City, and Deborah Kaplan for the New York City courts. From the Office of Court Administration, the all-important administrative arm of the courts, we have Nancy Barry, who is our Chief of Operations, Justin Barry, who is, no, no relation between those two, <laughs> Justin Barry, who is Chief of Administration, and Michael Magliano, who is here with us today, the Chief of our Department of Public Safety. We are also pleased to have with us a strong contingent, I think they're all present, of all of our administrative judges and supervising judges, including our uh, preside, acting presiding justice of the Court of Claims, Dick Seif. From the executive branch of government, we have Barbara Underwood, the Solicitor General. Welcome back to this familiar space. Lynn Tabbitt, the Deputy New York State Inspector General, Nelson Scheingold, the Counsel to the State Comptroller, as well as additional members of the executive branch, including the Governor's Office. From the organized bar, we have Sherry Levin Wallach, President-elect of the New York State Bar Association, and we have Hank Greenberg, past president of the association, counsel to the Commission on Judicial Nomination, and he serves, Mr. Greenberg does, in many roles that serve the best interest and value of the court and justice system. Thank you all for participating in today's program. So, each year, the American Bar Association, as you know, selects a theme, a special theme, for Law Day events all around the country. And this year's theme is toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change. And it reminds us that the genius of the longest lasting constitutional democracy in the world, the absolute genius of our form of government, lies in the ability of the people to make the necessary refinements to their federal and state constitutions in order to meet the needs of an ever-evolving and progressing nation. The 2022 National Law Day theme has special significance for New Yorkers this year, and that's because this year we have a golden opportunity to begin the process of amending our state constitution to simplify and modernize our trial court system through court reform designed to meet the ever-evolving and progressing justice needs 
of the communities that we serve throughout this state. And we are this year asking the legislature and ultimately the people of this state to give us the tools that we need to finally address and fix what Jay Johnson, our special advisor on equal justice, sharply characterized as an archaic system that con contributes to a second class system of justice for litigants of color in our high volume courts throughout the state. And we are heartened and we are encouraged that our partners in government have responded to the urgent need for court reform and simplification with, state, with Senate Judiciary Chair Brad Hoylman and the Assembly Judiciary Chair Charles Levine introducing legislation this year to consolidate our trial courts into a new, simplified and modern structure. We are grateful to the sponsors of these bills and of course, to the legislature's leadership, Speaker Carl Hasty, Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins for recognizing that the discussion around reform is long overdue and for advancing this initiative and working in service to who? To the people of this state. So on this law day, as we celebrate and commit to our theme, the Constitution in times of change, I urge every individual and organization with a stake in the future of the court system to make your voices heard. Make your voices heard in support of what is indisputably and undeniably in the best interests of the millions and millions of litigants who come through our courthouse doors seeking every year the services that only we can provide to them. So I thank you all in advance for your anticipated support of this initiative. Now, of course, the judicial branch is not the only branch of government charged with protecting rights and upholding the rule of law. Our next speaker, the 67th Attorney General of the State of New York, serves as both the state's chief legal officer and most important, the people's lawyer responsible for advising executive branch officials, defending actions and proceedings brought against the state, and protecting the legal and constitutional rights of all New Yorkers. Attorney General Letitia James, General James, we are so pleased to welcome you back to the podium as you co-host this year's Law Day celebration. Good morning, um, and thank you for that kind introduction, Chief Judge Janet DeFiori. Of course, to all of the um, honorable judges of the Court of Appeals, uh, to members of the bench, to the bar, to the entire Office of Court Administration for bringing us uh, together today, to T. Andrew Brown, President of the New York State Bar Association. Um, and I know that none of this would be possible without the extraordinary efforts of Chief Administrative Judge Larry Marks. Let me also acknowledge uh, the Solicitor General, Barbara Underwood, um, on this law day. On this day, we come together to celebrate and to explore the rule of law, uh, the set of guidelines that allow us to navigate our country and our people through times of turbulence and triumph, of right and wrong, and of progress and peril. Every year, the theme of this important day is to spotlight the most pressing and relevant issues facing the judiciary. The topics that have been addressed have focused on many areas, human rights, immigration, an independent judiciary, and how the rule of law acts as a fulcrum, carefully balancing the scales of justice. Today's theme, toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change, is critically important in times when the very foundation of our rule of law and democracy has been called into question. Our nation is polarized, my friends. We're fractured, we're divided. And as we meet here today, there is a congressional committee investigating the events of January 6th that sought to shatter the bedrock of law and order, the peaceful transvi transition of power, the predictable governance under the law, and the challenges to rekindle reverence and respect 
for the rule of law and its foundation. Our democracy's organizing principles are not the providence of partisan politics. Indeed, they belong to all Americans living through all times. And the bond cementing the underpinnings of our republic is sealed by the force of law that all of us in this room and all of those who came before us dedicated their lives to. The Equal Protection Clause contained in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, fundamentally an American protection, beautifully simple and simultaneously powerful. But it was the work of lawyers who told on landmark cases that enabled the application of one of our republic's hallmark protections for its citizens. The 14th Amendment is also known as the Due Process Clause that guarantees that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In deciding whether due process concerns are implicated by a particular state act, a court must consider whether that act offends the canons of decency and fairness so rooted in the traditions and conscious to be ranked as fundamental. From, Bound, from Brown versus Board of Education to Reed versus Reed to Roe versus Wade in 1973, the 14th Amendment was given life by the work of lawyers and other motivated Americans who strove to enact the promise of the Constitution into the tangible actions of our government and the fortification of a shared floor for civil rights protections for everyone in our nation. And while the phrase, hanging chads, may still, set, may still send some of us into an anxiety spell, like I just went through, <laughs> the truth is, is that Bush versus Gore and the acceptance of that decision by all parties represented a critical manifestation of the principle of peaceful transform power that dates back to the seminal Adams-Jefferson transi transition in 1801. You see, the violence and the vitriol and the complete disregard for the rule of law made it clearly impossible on January 6th to con conjure a difficult but un ultimately successful experimentation of our democratic practice in the Bush versus Gore era, and much less the graceful exit of President John Adams after his defeat at the hands of President Thomas Jefferson. But perhaps we will never know how close we came to losing our republic on January 6th. But here is what I know and what we should all know, and that is the events were not a subtle premonition. It was a five-alarm fire that can only be put out by the complete and total commitment to constant vigilance and a dogged defense of our democracy and the rule of law, and, let I, and allow me to add education of those values to a country which is at war with itself. All of you in this room, led by our esteemed judiciary, are the vanguards of this vigilance and the action that takes place in our courtrooms, our civic classrooms, and in the public square as you interpret the Constitution. And as you do so, I promise you that you will find an attorney general who matches your passion for the law and your devotion to justice. When I became attorney general, I swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution as all of you in this room. To ensure, I made an oath to ensure that no one was the above the law and no one beyond its reach. I view my role as an administer of law who acts in the interest of the public. And I believe these vows to be inextricable from one another. And that is why I have fought to guarantee the rights of transgender students under the Equal Protection Clause in Adams versus School Board of St. John's County. That is why in Reproductive Health Services versus Pearson and Little Rock Family Planning Services versus Rutledge, we've gone to court to ensure that the constitutional right to reproductive care must be protected. That is why I challenge the former federal administration's efforts to lock away immigrant children in cages under the due process law. That is why we sued Rensselaer County for failing to provide votes in that county uh, with adequate and accessible access to early polling sites, specifically in low income and communities of color, and we won. 
And that is why in People versus the City of New York, we sued to protect the rights of those peacefully protesting lawful actions. The Founding Fathers who wrote and ratified the Due Process Clauses of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment never dreamed that laws against, against interracial marriage, or laws against marriage between adults of the same gender would be deemed to violate the Constitution. But now it is beyond dispute that they do. And why? Because committed citizens applied the principles of the Constitution to the law and brought our law and our government in line with those principles and along the way brought to this land a more perfect union. And of course, to form a more perfect union, we must recognize that our fates and our destinies are united and inextricable. Our living constitution is an essential foundation for our union. But the everyday struggles for progress should be inclusive of all of us. The law is not simply words on a parchment kept under glass. It must live. It must breathe. It must apply to all of us. As the former United States Attorney General Bobby Kennedy once said, the glory of justice and the majesty of law are created not just by the Constitution, nor by the courts, nor by offices of the law, law nor by the lawyers, but by the men and women who constitute our society, who are protectors of the law as they are themselves protected by the law. We are we the people. We are the inheritors and stewards of our living constitution, charged with advancing liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Our constitution will need to continue to be applied in ways that marry the needs of our society with constitutional protections that are the birthright of every, every single American, with action, with vigilance, and with an unflinching commitment to the rule of law. We can strive to make our union better, more just, more united, as we peacefully exchange and debate ideas. That is our mission this day, and I am proud to stand by your side as we advance this message in New York and throughout this country. Thank you, and may God bless all of you. Thank you, General James. Our next speaker is T. Andrew Brown, the president of the New York State Bar Association, representing over 70,000 lawyers across the state, and an association that has been aligned with and advocating on behalf of court reform for many, many years, as well as an increase in the compensation that is paid to the dedicated and hardworking 18B lawyers who represent criminal indigent defendants in our criminal courts throughout the state, and of course, parents and children in our family courts throughout the state, an increase that we in the courts have loudly and vociferously advocated for and one that is urgently, urgently needed to ensure that New York is adequately protecting the legal rights and interests of people of limited means. So thank you for your strong advocacy um, by your association. And I now call on President Brown to address our congregation. Honorable Chief Judge DeFiori, Honorable Associate Judges, Honorable Attorney General James, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to stand before such a distinguished collection of people here this morning as I represent the New York State Bar Association. Greetings on behalf of our 70,000 members throughout the state across the country, and in more than 100 countries around the world. Law Day is a day that comes just once a year. We come together to recognize the importance 
of the rule of law in our daily lives to protect our freedoms, our liberties as Americans, as citizens. This is a day that is recognized throughout the country. It is a day that is celebrated throughout the country. It's a day that we come together on a common theme. This year's theme, as you see on the program, toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change. As I woke up this morning, looked at television, what's going on in Ukraine, other parts around the world, around our country. I was quickly reminded of the importance of the rule of law, the role it plays in our daily lives, the importance of it. Not a day goes by that we don't in some way find ourselves impacted by laws, structures. It's essential. It is indeed a highlight of my presidency to be able to share some words on this theme in this distinguished house. I was privileged to take my oath of office in this beautiful courtroom just last spring. Thank you, Chief Judge, for swearing me in. Every time I'm here in this illustrious body, and this is illustrious courthouse. I am overwhelmed by the centuries of history, the majesty of the setting and gravity of the rulings made by this court. Thinking about the theme of this year's Law Day, focusing on our Constitution and how we can form a more perfect union, it goes without saying that the Constitution is vitally important to each and every one of us. It is essential to everything this building represents to our sense of justice and jurisprudence, and to each and every one of us as individuals, as lawyers, as judges. While our Constitution is a remarkable document, it was and it is only a start to a more perfect union. A piece of paper by itself does nothing. We must not only advocate for this document that we hold so dear, but we also challenge how well we as a society are being true to it. It is not enough to have justice for some, but not all. True justice cannot be partial. As lawyers, defending the Constitution, upholding the rule of law is our sacred trust. The rule of law is one of the bedrock principles upon which our democracy is based. Every day, we fight to protect the public's faith in our system of government and continue to urge our duly elected leaders to uphold our Constitution. While it's not perfect, the court system in which we practice remains the last bastion of truth and civility, serving as a check and balance on the fountain of misinformation sadly so prevalent in today's society. This is something our profession can be proud of, something that makes us want to be lawyers and judges. Yet, perhaps more than ever, we have seen our Constitution and rule of law at risk these last few years. We have seen how fragile and precious the rule of law could be in the wrong hands, but we have also seen how strong the rule of law is and will continue to be. And we, each of us, has a role to play in seeing to that. There are certain things we can do to live out the promise of the Constitution. To the rest of the world, and I was reminded of this as I've spent the past week out of the country with other leaders within our profession from around the world, the United States to the rest of the world is viewed as what a perfect union looks like. We forget that. We're looked at as what a model government should look like. We have an obligation to ourselves and to the rest of the world to live up to that standard. Let us be our harshest critics. Right now, we regularly witness social upheaval, discrimination, and injustice 
ugly reminders of a stain that still blights America and prevents segments of our society from achieving the American dream. We are human beings. We are never going to be perfect. Certainly no system designed by humans for humans ever will be. But we can try and we must. When the Constitution was created, certain people were left out. The Constitution was written by people who did not look like me. And it was written for people who did not look like me. Some individuals are still not treated fairly and continue to be victims of inequality, injustices, institutional racism. In order to achieve a more perfect union, we have to do more as a country, as a state, as individuals. We must protect the individual rights of disenfranchised citizens. Still to this day, too many are left out of the protections and rights and opportunities of our laws and constitution. Still, people of color are denied the equal opportunities in employment, education, housing, and other facets of daily life. Same can be true in many instances for women and our LGBTQ citizens. While we should be striding, striving to provide greater access and opportunity to the benefits of laws and constitutional rights, some are striving for just the opposite. For the good of our country, we must all find ways to stand against this. And there are hundreds of bills in at least 40 states right now striving to limit voting rights with the greatest impact on people of color. The New York State Bar Association has long supported measures that increase voter participation and inclusion of all communities. We are gravely concerned about laws being passed across the country that make it more difficult for voters to exercise this fundamental right. We have to allow people equal rights to participate in government. There is simply no greater right and opportunity to participate in our democratic processes than voting. It is about equal opportunity to engage and have a voice. Yet so many people have been denied that opportunity, including blacks and other people of color. Happily here in New York, we have been the leader in voting rights protections. And the benefits that we see here in New York are not simply realized and afforded to many throughout our country. Again, we may never be perfect, but we can absolutely strive to get there. Doing so is for the good of one and all. We also cannot think of just the present moment. We must imagine what the future will look like for our youth of today. How do we maintain a model government and society for generations to come? It's not simply about us who are here at this moment. It is easy to get discouraged amidst the chaos and confusion of today's times. There are indeed reasons to be optimistic about the future, however. When I talk to my teenage daughter about the world, I am encouraged by her knowledge and optimism and sense of right and wrong. There is a profound sense and a deep responsibility of leaving behind a better world for better for future generations. We talk about inclusion and belonging, ensuring that we all do the right thing, being a good citizen and friend, and knowing when to stick up for ourselves, others, and our community. Actions speak louder than words. Putting a law on the books does not bring about instant change. The only way to effectuate meaningful change is to address long-standing, deep-seated issues directly by our words and through our actions. Everyone in this room today has a mission and a responsibility to uphold the laws and constitution. We as lawyers, no matter our political beliefs, must find common ground in our shared responsibility to advocate for individual liberties guaranteed in the Constitution. We must be the model citizens that our model government envisions as we create a more perfect union. The New York State Bar Association will remain strong and steadfast in its leadership as we move forward in this noble pursuit. In the name of justice, it should never be about one of us, 
but all of us. Thank you. Thank you, President Brown. And now we proceed to the portion of our Law Day ceremony that I know we all take great pride in and we look forward to, and that's the presentation of the Judith S. K. Service Awards. Those awards are uh, given to folks who have demonstrated that they have an aptitude and ability to go above and beyond the call of service and for their great con contributions to the court and to the communities that they serve. And to present the service awards, it's my pleasure to call upon our wonderful Chief Administrative Judge Larry Marks to do the presentations. Chief Marks. Thank you, Judge DeFiori. It's a privilege for me to be able to lead this uh, Next portion of our Court of Appeals Law Day celebration um, as we present the, our service awards. And um, they, uh, as was noted, they're named in honor of the late revered Judith S. K., whose portrait looks down on us from the back of the room. This year's honorees include five employees from around the state, uh, four of whom are being recognized for outstanding work performance, one for an act of heroism. So I begin uh, with one of our award recipients in the exemplary work performance category, Nikita Mabane, a court assistant in Westchester County in the New Rochelle City Court. Nikita is a relative newcomer to the court system who in less than four years has distinguished herself as an avid learner and quick study. She is highly regarded by the court's judges and staff for her keen interest in court operations, assisting with the court clerk's training on new procedures. Ready to pitch in at a moment's notice, she provided critical support to the New Rochelle City Court Judge Jared Rice in the launch of the court's innovative, innovative opportunity Youth Part, a diversion program for at-risk youth ages six, 16 through 24. She has also provided clerical assistance to the court's Raise the Age Part, which addresses the unique needs of adolescent offenders. Nikita is a true star with a very bright future in the New York State Courts, and we are pleased to honor her with the Judith K. Service Award for exemplary work performance. Next, in the exemplary work performance category are award recipients Anna Wilkinson and Jessica Douglas of the Capital Region's Third Judicial District Administrative Office, which relies heavily on these two dedicated resourceful employees in carrying out programs to promote access to justice and equal justice in the courts throughout the district. Anna, a senior court analyst, and Jessica, a court analyst, have been instrumental in the success of a range of initiatives from the district's community court access program and implicit bias training to its careers in the courts program, Faith Leaders Day and Black History Month and Women's History Month events among, among others. <clears throat> they are hands-on from start to finish, coordinating the many logistics and ensuring the quality of these important programs. For their enormous efforts, we proudly present them with this year's Judith K. Service Award for Exemplary Work Performance. Now to our fourth exemplary work performance honoree, Carrie Wohn, 
the recently retired Borough Chief Clerk of the New York City Criminal Court in Queens County. As Borough Chief Clerk of one of the state's busiest criminal courts, Carrie deftly managed a formidable workload, donning an array of hats and demonstrating extraordinary dedication and leadership. He worked tirelessly in his 24 years of stellar service to improve the delivery and quality of justice always rising to the challenge and readily adapting, whether in the face of a severe weather event, a fiscal crisis, or a global pandemic. We are pleased to honor him with the Judith K. Service Award for exemplary work performance. Carey could not be here today because he's recovering from surgery, but he will receive his award at a, at a separate se ceremony in New York City. Now, moving on to the award for heroism, this year we honor court officer Raymond Bailey of the Rockland County Courts. Nearly a year ago, on the night of May 18th, 2021, Officer Bailey awoke to discover his neighbor's house on fire. Springing into action, he called 911 to report the fire, then dashed to his neighbor's home, breaking in a window and calling out to alert the family. With no response, he entered the home, finding two of the family's children coughing and shouting for their mom. After evacuating the two children and bringing them to the safety of his own home, Officer Bailey returned to his neighbor's house, assisting the mom in finding both her, child, her other child and her husband. Once these three were in the safety of the Bailey home, he again returned to his neighbor's house, where for the next several hours, he helped the fire department control and extinguish the fire. For his selfless, life-saving actions that day, we proudly present Officer Bailey with the Judith K. Service Award for an act of heroism. So that brings us to the close of the 2022 Law Day Awards presentations. This year's honorees represent the finest in public service and make us all very proud. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you all. That concludes the ceremony. Thank you for being here, and we hope that you have a meaningful Law Day ceremony, not only today, but every day. Thank you. Thank you.